vagabonds Come all you don't belongs Winners and losers Come people like me Come all you travelers Tired from the journey Come wait a while, stay a while Welcome you'll be Come all you questioners Looking for answers And searching for reasons And sense in it all Come all you fallen Find strength for your body and food for your soul. Come to the feast, there is room at the table. Come, let us meet in this place. With the king of all kindness, he welcomes us in with the wonder of love and the power of grace. The wonder of love and the power of grace. church this morning. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to those who might be watching at home on the live stream. Let me bring to you some important news. A member of our congregation has sadly passed away. That's Mr. Bill Southern. Uh, Bill has been a faithful member of our church for many, many years and he's been very much serving our church as one of the Friday men. The planters outside up until the pandemic, Bill was um, um, and putting um, flowers in them and turning them over and regularly um, making them look great. He was one of the Friday men who went out to the churchyard to keep the grounds well maintained. And a lovely man. And um, he, he's reached a grand old age of 91, which is wonderful. And um, sadly, through a recent um, fall and, 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 and things, he ended up in the hospital, and, and um, that, that's how that's happened. But um, his funeral's going to be on Friday, and his son and daughter, Billy and Helen, would like to invite you as, a, as, a, as his church family to come. It's in the building here at Christchurch Fonts on a Friday at 1 o'clock. That's Friday the 4th of February, followed by a burial in the churchyard. And then followed by refreshments at the Bay Horse. And you, you're welcome to all three aspects of that time together on Friday at one o'clock here at church. So Bill was somebody who enjoyed coming to this congregation. This is the service he came to. He loved to sing, in fact, as well. And we were even planning him singing solo at one point in one of our services. And I just have this wonderful image now of, of Bill enjoying singing in the glorious kingdom of heaven, singing the praises to his saviour. Let's be still and remember Bill for a moment and be quiet and then I'll lead us in a prayer to pray for his family. Heavenly Father, we come today as your children. We are brothers and sisters. You've united us as a family by the blood of your son. We thank you for our brother in Christ, Bill, for all that he's meant to us here, for his faith, his service, and his love and praise of you. We thank you for his long life, well lived, but we recognize his family would have liked it to have been even longer. So we pray that in their grief, you will really strengthen and bless them. Praying for Billy and for Helen and for Denise and for Garth and for their families, that you'll pour your precious love into their hearts and minds and comfort them at this difficult time. We pray for Friday, but the service for Bill will be a fitting tribute to you, God, and to Bill's life here on earth. So please bless that, and please comfort all who mourn, we pray. Amen. Well, this week, well, last week, things were a little bit disrupted by different um, positive cases of the virus. Please do continue to pray for Bob Wooding, who's been um, off with the virus all week and is still positive at the moment. He's, gen he's been generally okay. Hello, Bob, he's watching the live stream and Leslie. But I do pray for Bob that he might feel stronger and be clear of that soon. And uh, my family have had it too. We're gradually coming back into force now. And so it's good to be back here. But um, our activities this week will continue um, and we'll just put the brakes on when we need to. So we will have things like lyrics on lunch tomorrow, but maybe not the lyrics side of it, just the lunch part of it. We will have pilgrims rest, we will have lunches through the week, and if anything changes, then I'll let you know by our weekly emails. So do come along to things, do come along to Bible studies on Monday nights or Wednesday morning, batting chat, there's all sorts of things taking place. Do come along and be part of this week-long church community. 
It's wonderful to have such a full music group today. Um, we, uh, those on the live stream, you can't always see the musicians behind uh, the first two, but we have a good team today. It's lovely to welcome Paul back as well on cello here this morning. So thank you, Paul, for being here and for taking part in the music group. And let's make sure that as we're singing God's praises, we're singing from our heart and making whatever joyful noise we can make, um, it delights God when we praise him in this place of worship here today. And we were meant to have our first inaugural sort of roast dinner today, Sunday lunch at one o'clock, but I hope all of you who have booked to know that we called it off last week because of, um, of, of my wife Lauren having the virus, so we're going to have it next week instead. So we have 36 booked in, so you're still booked in unless you tell me otherwise. So that's next Sunday, one o'clock, in the um, community centre hall for a lovely roast dinner, and that should be a really nice occasion. I'm going now to publish the Bands of Marriage for Amy and Dave. Amy and Dave were here last week and are probably watching on the live stream today and might be here tonight at Treehouse. So I'm going to, with great pleasure, publish the Bands of Marriage for Amy and Dave. We're getting married in a few months' time, and it's wonderful that we have church members being married here and we can celebrate with them in their special preparations. I published the Bands of Marriage between Amy Louise Averton and David Neil Breakwell both of St. John's Parish Little Thornton, but obviously attending here with qualifying connection. This is for the second time of asking, if any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it. Let's pray for them. Almighty God, we thank you for Amy and Dave, for calling them together to be companions for a lifetime, to know your love and to love one another. Bless them in all their preparations and bless their special wedding day. Please, Lord, may the love that they have now increase daily and may they know the increase of your love in their hearts and minds each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, do you follow along on the screen the words of the service that um, I say will be in yellow and the ones that we say all together are in white. Let me now just introduce the theme of our service today. Last Sunday, Jesus was thrown out of the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. And the Gospel of Luke continues with Jesus visiting a synagogue in Capernaum, where he healed a man possessed by a demon. The people were amazed because his words had authority and power. And the reading continues with Jesus healing many of the people and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God in the synagogues. So we look forward to reflecting on that Bible reading shortly. But we're going now to stand to sing our first song of praise from Heaven You Came, Helpless Babe. The 
still for a moment and reflect on those words and so now we come together as the bride of Christ to say to him that we are sorry as we say these words together father eternal giver of light and grace we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in what we have fought in what we have said and done through ignorance through weakness through our own deliberate fault, we have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue in prayer with our collect for this day. God of power and might, you sent prophets to your people, calling us back to your covenant and teaching them your ways. In the fullness of time, you sent us your son, Jesus Christ, teaching with such authority to open their eyes to see your ways. Open our hearts and minds, that we may understand and proclaim your teachings for all to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his words possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ah, what have you do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? You have come to destroy us. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and said, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had come out of him, he threw him down in their midst. He came out of him, and having done him no harm, they were amazed and said to one another, What is this word? 
for and with authority and power he commands even unclean spirits and they come out and reports to him went out into every place of the surrounding region Jesus heals many and he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever and they appealed to him on her behalf and he stood over her and rebuked the fever and he left her and immediately she rose and began to serve them now when the sun was setting all those who had and were very sick with various diseases brought them to him and he laid his hands on them and healed them and demons also came out of many crying you are the son of god but to rebuke them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. And it was, and when it was that day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose, and he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. Please do be seated. Thank you, Ron, for reading. Do keep that passage open so we can look at it together. And um, I think it's been about three weeks now we've been going to look through the beginning of Luke's gospel. And there's much to enjoy and learn and be challenged about. Just to recap, last week we looked at the passage where Jesus went back to his hometown, to Nazareth. He went to the synagogue, remember? And he was passed a scroll to read from the prophet Isaiah. And he found what we now know as being chapter, one of Isaiah, chapter 61 of Isaiah. And Jesus chose this passage which said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And I said last week how that was Jesus saying, I am the one who has been promised. Century after century, they've been expecting the Messiah, the the Christ, the anointed one to come from heaven, from God. The one whom the Spirit of God was upon and anointing. And now Jesus was saying, I'm here. It's me. The Spirit of God anointed him at his baptism and drove him into the wilderness, was now driving him into the temple. And Jesus says, I'm the one. And I've come with a mission to proclaim good news to the poor. But remember what the people did. They had a choice. They could have worshipped him and fell down on their knees and said, praise you God on earth. But they didn't. They drove him out of the town, we're told. At the end of um, of that passage last week, verse 29, chapter 4. They rose up, drove him out of the town, and brought him to the brow of the hill. And um, it says they they could throw him down the cliff. So they wanted to kill him. After hearing him say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, they wanted to kill him. Partly because they recognized he was Joseph's son, one of their own, from Nazareth. Partly because what he said to them after saying that is, after they said that is that he reminded them of the Old Testament when God showed mercy to the Gentiles and non-Jews and he mentioned a few different people there, such as Zarephath and and, uh, Naaman. And in light of Jesus saying, I've come to bring good news to all people, Jew and non-Jew, they were angry and wanted to kill Jesus. So just hold in mind, first of all then, what I'm showing to you is that Last week, our passage showed great unbelief. There was Jesus, God the Son, in front of them, in a synagogue, teaching from his scriptures. But they didn't believe that he was who he said he was. In fact, they wanted to kill him. Now look what happens in our next part of chapter 4, verse 31 onwards. He went down to Capernaum. He was teaching And we're told in verse 32, they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. So that tells us something about the tone 
The way he was speaking his words, there was something unique and different about him. And in verse 33, we're told, in a synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Even the demon recognized who Jesus was. Somehow, he knew his name and where he was from, Jesus of Nazareth. But look at the last part of the verse. He says, the demon says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Look at that. Only earlier in his hometown of Nazareth, in front of people in a synagogue, they did not have belief in who he was. And yet the demon recognized that Jesus was the Holy One of God. Now there's an important point to take in today. When we speak of and think about the things of the spiritual world, of the evil spiritual world, such as Satan and his demons, they believe in God. They know he exists. They've experienced his presence. They have no doubt that God is God. So whereas... The people in the synagogue did not recognize Jesus' divinity. The demon says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I suppose the thing to take from that is then, actually, knowing God isn't really enough, is it? The demons know God. Doesn't make them right with God. Doesn't make them, to use the language of being saved. They haven't received salvation. Yes, they know God, but they hate God. They don't want anything to do with God. They don't want to worship God and follow God and live with him eternally. But the Christian, the true Christian, loves God, wants to follow God, pursues God, seeks God, seeks first his kingdom. The demons don't do that, but they do believe in God. So to all of us watching and listening, remember, believing in God on its own is not really enough, is it? We must come to a, a true faith, a belief in who God is, Father, Son, and Spirit, and be right with him through the death of his son, Jesus, to be in relationship with him, to be at one with him, to be friends with God in that sense. That's what matters most. Look at what Jesus said next, verse 35. Jesus rebuked the demon and said, be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed so we see here that Jesus had authority and power to command this unclean spirit, this demon, to leave another man. And that's what the people said to each other. Look at verse 36. They were all amazed and said to one another, what is this word? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. So clearly now we see that we can have confidence that this happened because the people who saw it happen believed it happened, if you see what I'm saying. They weren't saying to each other, oh, look at that magic trick, wasn't that amazing? This wasn't some kind of magic trick. This was truly the Son of God on earth having power and authority to command an unclean spirit to leave a human being. And the unclean spirit left. They were amazed at the power of and authority of Jesus. And so much so that in verse 37 we see reports about Jesus went into every place in the surrounding region. So now words got out. Imagine the conversations. Did you see what happened yesterday? Jesus cast out an unclean spirit out of whatever so-and-so's name was. Imagine the, the amazement at people saying, wow, isn't that incredible? Who could do such a thing? Only God, of course. So we see here, Jesus has the power to rebuke, to tell off, to cast out, to remove what we might call the enemy, the evil one's minions, demons. Now this begs a question for all of us, I'm sure, is, well, do we really believe in this stuff? Well, I believe it, because the Bible is God's revelation of himself. It's there for us to understand and to believe. But I believe it happened back then, 
than not now. I believe there was no greater time of ferocious attack of the enemy, Satan, upon his people than when the Son of God was walking on earth. That's when the battle really took place. We see that tremendous or awful wilderness experience that Jesus had when he was tempted by Satan himself. And we see that when Jesus went from town to town, there were people possessed, inhabited by some sort of evil spirit, what we might call a demon, or an unclean spirit. But for you as a Christian, what embodies you, what imbibes you? Well, it's the Holy Spirit. Every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Therefore, it's incompatible for us to have inside of us an unclean spirit or an evil spirit or a demon, all the same. So please, as a Christian, don't have any fear or paranoia or sense of thinking, well, what if I've got one? No, you haven't. The Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't believe the Holy Spirit is going to have any room or any place for the Christian to have any spirit other than the Holy Spirit of God, that deposit of our salvation in our hearts and minds. So have no fear that as Christians we can somehow be, um, you know, lived in um, by a evil spirit. Look what happens next, verse 38. Jesus arose, left the synagogue, and entered Simon's house. This is Simon Peter. Now Simon's Peter mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on their behalf, on her behalf. Now back then there was no A and E, there was no paramedics that could come and take you away and put you on a drip and oxygen and um, you know and get you back on track again. A high fever could have been deadly. It really, was a very serious thing. In verse thirty-nine, we see Jesus stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she rose and began to serve them. We see something similar here to what we happened before. Jesus, encountering a demon, rebuked the demon, and the demon left the man, and now Jesus encounters a woman who's ill, and he rebukes the fever. It shows the power of God on earth, that over everything that's living, or even not living, he has complete power. A microscopic, single-celled bacteria, a living organism, Jesus has authority over, just as he has authority over a demon that inhabits a person. There isn't anything on earth or in heaven that Jesus does not have authority over. And so the fever left here, and the healing was so dramatic and so complete. Look what happened. Immediately she rose and began to serve them. There was no recovery time needed. There was no, well, I'll go out to bed for the afternoon and get up later on. No, immediately she wanted to serve them. She'd gone from the point of death, a high fever, probably some sort of bacterial infection, quite serious, to then suddenly serving those around her. This was an instantaneous, complete healing of Simon's mother-in-law. And then we're told it was getting late, the sun was setting, verse 40, and all those who had any sick with various diseases brought them to him. Imagine the cues. People have realized that this man can cast out demons and heal fever. And we're told in verse 40, Jesus healed every one of them. Verse 41, the demons came out, many crying, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. Notice again, they knew he was the Christ. Remember, knowing Jesus is Christ is great, but don't take any credit for yourself for it because so do the demons know that Jesus is Christ. Make sure we put our full trust, our faith, make sure we have that living and active relationship with Jesus, that friendship by accepting all that he did for us when he came to earth, the life that he lived, which is perfect, the death that he died, which should have been ours, the punishment for our sin, which only we deserved. To accept Jesus, to trust him, is to say, Jesus, I need you. I'm helpless without you. I'm hell-bound without you, but heaven-bound with you. To trust Jesus, to invite him, to reach out and accept that gift of friendship is what it really means to be a Christian, not just to know that God exists, but to experience and to live in relationship with him. 
Well, let's bring all this now into our own lives here today. First of all, I wanted to reassure you that we don't have to fear having a, a demon in us. But that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't have an awareness of a spiritual battle taking place. As we put on the news today and read the papers, we'll see that there's all sorts of nervousness about nations surrounding other nations with tanks and soldiers and are we on the verge of a, a major war? And that's sad and we pray that that won't happen. But you know, the Christian is engaged in war daily. You might not always realise it. We're engaged in a spiritual battle, a cosmic war, where Satan and his demons are out to try and confuse us and cause doubt and unsettle us. He is Satan, the father of lies, not truth. He wants to tempt, wants to cause confusion about God and do we really believe in him and are we really worthy of him and are we really forgiven? That's the voice of Satan in our lives. I want to read to you a passage from uh, 1 Peter. If you've got your Bible then, turn with me to page 1017. Keep your finger in Luke if you can. Page 1017, 1 Peter chapter 5. Page 1017, I'm going to start reading at verse 8, just four lines down on that page. Peter writes, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Of course, not literally like a prowling lion. We'd see him and be scared. But spiritually, that cosmic battle is still happening. The devil prowls around spiritually like a roaring lion, just looking for weakness to pounce upon. So what do we do? Do we panic? Live in fear? No, look at verse 9. It's simple but profound. Two words. Resist him. How do you do that? Look at the next few words. Firm in your faith. How do you do that when life's tough? Well, look at the next bit. Knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So if you sense in your spiritual lives at times like Satan's attacking you, remember it's not just you. Your brotherhood across the globe experiences your suffering too. Because the devil's not out just to get you, but all of the believers of God. But we have everything we need to resist him. We can, it says, resist him, firm in our faith. So that's something that's really important, to be firm in our faith, to be strong. And our faith is like a muscle. It needs stretching. It needs building. That's why it's so important to read our Bibles, to pray, to worship God. Don't let it become something that just wastes away and becomes lazy. Exercise that faith. But second, we know from the New Testament and what um, Paul says to us, that we have the whole armour of God we can put on. The spiritual armour that we can put on. So, as we think about demons and Satan, the evil spiritual world, don't fret or fear. Resist him by being firm in your faith. Now, I said to you, keep your finger in Luke, but I didn't. <laughs> Let me find it again now. Luke chapter 4, as we finish with. Page 860. So let's go on a quick recap. In the, t in the synagogue, in Nazareth, the people didn't believe in Jesus. Yet, the demon-possessed man did. Jesus had authority to rebuke the demon, and the demon left. Jesus had authority to rebuke the fever in the woman who was ill, and it left. Jesus, therefore, has authority over everything in life. I want to ask you a question. Does he have authority over you? Have you submitted yourself to his authority in every part of life? Picture yourself with a crown on your head. Picture yourself with a, a beautiful crown of jewels, like the queen wears at her, you know, um, in, um, what's the word I'm after? 
That's the one, coronation. When we went to see the crown jewels in London over summer, it was wonderful to see them. So heavy, so big, so glorious. But when a king or queen wears a crown, they're showing their authority. Now either in your life, you are king of your life, or Jesus is. There's no middle ground. There's no share in the crown. And to have Jesus as authority in your life is not a bad thing. It's letting him have his rightful place and serving him and loving him. Remember that he's a servant king who came to serve us. So please make sure that in your life you've submitted everything to Jesus. All of your plans for the future. All of your concerns about the future. It might be you're fretting about your business, your diary, your bank account, your um, family members. Whatever is on your mind, Jesus has authority over everything. Even the microscopic single-celled bacteria. Even the demons in the cosmos. So don't worry. Because when we're in Christ, he's got our back. It doesn't mean we won't suffer. But it does mean he's in charge. And I want to finish our time together with looking at this wonderful passage in Romans chapter 8. If you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 8 on page 945. The question Paul asks is, can anything separate us from God, from the love of Christ? Look at verse 35. Just about six lines down on page 945. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? Look at verse 37. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And now take these words in. Because it means that no matter what life throws at us, even Satan himself... Jesus has all authority. Look at me, listen to these words. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, brackets, demons, bacteria, future plans, family concerns, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when you know Christ... And know him truly. When you know God. Not like the demons. But when you're in relationship with Jesus. When you're friends with Jesus. No matter what life throws at us. Nothing can separate you. From the love of God. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Because Christ has authority over everything. And he'll never let anything. Separate you from his love. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that nothing that's in our life right now, which is a problem or a burden or an anxiety or a situation, can separate us from your incredible love and from a relationship with yourself. So please, may we live the week ahead in confidence that everything ultimately is okay because we're loved by you now and forever. And help us, Lord Jesus, to submit to your authority, to place the crown of our lives on your head so that you might take control and might be in charge and might direct and lead our lives. Help us, Jesus, to resist the devil, to be firm in our faith. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Let's stand together as we respond in songs of praise. Oh.
standing to declare together our faith. We believe the grace of God has dawned upon us with healing for all the world and so we rejoice to declare our faith in him as we say together, we trust in God the Father who has revealed his love and kindness to us and in his mercy saved us not for any good deed of our own but because he is merciful. We trust in Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to free us from our sin and to set us apart for himself a people eager to do good. We trust in the Holy Spirit, whom God poured out on us generously through Christ our Saviour, so that justified by grace, we might become heirs with the hope of eternal life. Amen. Please be seated as Martin comes to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Living God, we praise you for your love shown to us in Christ. Your love that goes on seeking us out caring, guiding, protecting, forgiving, despite our lack of love for you and our failure to live as Jesus' disciples. Help us to live as your people. Give us a due sense of our responsibility towards others, the poor, the hungry and needy, the sick and the homeless, the oppressed and the lonely, the weak and the sorrowful, Help us to recognise our responsibility towards you and the world you have given us so that in everything we think and say and do, we may live for your glory and work for your kingdom. We ask this in your name. Amen. A prayer for the persecuted Christians, especially in Afghanistan, where this month has become the most persecuted country in the world for Christians. Jesus, we pray for the Christians who have stayed in Afghanistan and who are secret believers. We ask for your help, especially for the women and young girls who are not allowed to work or go to school. We pray for the 11 million people. Lord Jesus, we pray that you will help the people of Afghanistan. We ask this in your name. Amen. Lord Jesus, we just pray for the situation on the borders of Ukraine and Russia. We pray for, that all those involved with the negotiations will find a way of de-escalating the situation, which will bring peace to that, to that area of the world. We ask this in your name. Amen. Lord Jesus, we bring before you today, Lord, our leaders of our church here at Christ Church. We pray for Peter and for, and for Paul and for Damien. We pray, Lord, for the PCC and the decisions they will make at the next PCC meeting. 
we ask for your wisdom of Solomon on all people involved. We especially pray, Lord, for Damien, Lord, that he won't get weary for doing the good that he does and continue to trust you in all what he does. We pray for us as parishioners that we will encourage Damien and the, and the PCC as they work amongst us and we ask that the Holy Spirit will give them guidance and direction. We ask this in your name. Amen. Father God, we lift up all those who are facing illness today. Let us especially remember those now we know. We ask that you will bring healing, comfort and peace to their bodies. Calm their fears and let them experience the healing power of your love. In Jesus' name, Amen. And finally, Lord Jesus, we pray that you will still our souls and our minds and quieten our hearts as we approach the communion table this morning. We ask that you will draw each one of us into an even closer fellowship with you as we take the bread and the wine. We gratefully remember what you did for each one of us on Calvary's cross. We just ask this in your precious name. Thank you, Martin. Let's stand together as we prepare to share in a peace with one another. We are the body of Christ. In one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's turn to one another and just say to one another, the peace of the Lord be with you. And once you've done that, you're welcome to sit down. Peace to those at home as well. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We pray to our Father, just like Jesus, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
remembered the tremendous love of Christ through his death and resurrection. Let's pray now and thank him as we say this prayer together. Generous Lord, in word and Eucharist, we have proclaimed the mystery of your love. Help us so to live out our days, that we may be signs of your wonders in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's good to have songs of celebration and joy and quieter, more reflective songs of worship. And our last one now is one of those as we are still and remember and sense the presence of the Lord. Let's stand to sing, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord.
Let's be still. The demon shouted out, You are the Holy One of God. Lord Jesus Christ, we know you are the Holy One of God. And we love you. And we believe in you. And we desire to follow you closely in this week ahead. And to love you with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. And to love our neighbor as ourselves. We want to resist the devil. So may we be firm in our faith in this week ahead. We want to know your presence every moment in our lives. So be amongst us wherever we go. Thank you that no work is too hard for you. So whatever trials await us in our path this week, help us enter them confidently knowing that you are with us as our shepherd, walking with us at every junction, every turn. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Well, please do stay for a drink if you're able to in the hall. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.